Uh, hi, so yeah, I'm Ian Goddard. I work here at Design. I'm a software development engineer and test in charge of playback. Uh, that covers quite a wide remit, but uh, hopefully you'll be interested in hearing me talking about the challenges of testing playback at the scale that we do uh, here at Design. Some of the stuff that I'm going to cover today, just uh, give you a basic glass-to-glass -glass overview. That's from filming to you seeing it. It's glass-to-glass. -glass. Um, kind of where we were with broadcast, where that was, uh, some of the technologies we've run through, and into the OTT over the top world that we deal with now with us, Netflix, and, and the like. Some of the strange acronyms that you'll see me talk about, I'll explain them before I start talking about them. It makes it a lot easier for you to understand what I'm saying. Then we'll talk about some of the challenging areas that there are. Um, then we'll talk about playback in a microservice world. I'll also cover what a microservice world is, just in case there's anybody who's not quite familiar with that yet. And then we'll have a look at the sort of scary new world that's out there and the stuff that we're kind of looking forward to doing uh, in a QA environment. This is an old-fashioned broadcast workflow. It's probably very familiar to a lot of you. I'm sure you've all dealt with television in some form or another, be it working with it or watching it. Um, we used to do the production in the field, you do some editing there, maybe. It'd come through to the studio, whether do more editing, make it look polished. You'd compress it, you'd multiplex it, and you'd distribute it. This one, of course, a satellite network to your set-top box, your IDTVs, or your projectors, whatever that may be. Um, obviously, that's the same workflow for terrestrial television or for cable, all exactly the same. Broadcast came in a lot of different flavors. Uh, DVB is the Digital Video Broadcasting Association. They came in a terrestrial format, and it's a younger brother, slightly sleeker younger brother, T2, as well as cable, satellite. This is handheld, doesn't really get used very much, as I'm sure you're aware. Nobody's watching broadcast television on their phones. It's not really a thing. ATSC, it's a standard mostly used in the States, and ISDB, mostly used in Japan and Brazil. Who knew? This is an old-fashioned broadcast spectrum. As you can see, it's, there's some strange things going on here. What used to happen is you used to have this, this spike here where it says CH4, channel 4. That was it. You had one channel come through on here. It was a video carrier here. And you had two, trust me, there are two audio carriers for your left and right signals there. And that was what you used to have for your analog signal. And it's criminally inefficient. It's not very good covering the spectrum. There's only one thing you can have. It didn't carry subtitles or any of the metadata or any of the interesting EPG data or anything that could tell you anything more than just what's on broadcast right now. Then they went digital. They had a big switch over. I'm sure some of you are probably aware of the digital switch over that happened in the UK some years back. Some of you may or may not be. Um, but that's what happened now. We've actually got rid of this entire top line. Now we're down here with these MUX here, MUX 1, B, C, etc. These are a lot more efficient. They could carry a lot more information. You could get between seven and eight channels on there on a good day. HD channels would be slightly less, but you'd still have a lot more. And it could carry extra information. It could carry EPG data, so your guide would tell you a bit of information about what you're going to watch. It could carry subtitles. It could carry some extra audio. It could carry a lot of other things. So digital was a big step. There were a lot of sort of hybrids that came out of that using the internet. But we eventually ended up in this OTT, or over-the-top, format. Now, I've stolen this from the Google Cloud platform, as you can probably see. Um, but it's a very good example of stuff. So you have your live event, which goes through all its encoding and transcoding and everything down that end. But then it comes into a streaming server, and this exists in, in this case, the Google Cloud. You might do some editing there. That's all existing in the cloud. All your transcoding, your DRM, brandings, things that we'll talk about in a, in a bit, all happens in the cloud. It's all very easy. It then gets transferred to your live to VOD, or video on demand recording. That gets stored in your cloud storage. It then Potentially, you can also do that with your live as well, and it goes out to syndication, in this case, YouTube and Facebook, Read Zone and Netflix in there as well, doing live stuff eventually. And it's all gets to get stored in its VOD content, obviously Netflix and stuff there, and Zone as well does a lot of VOD content. At the same time as this is happening, you can push that exact same data into your ad insertion if you want to. You can put a lot of stuff in there, depending on how your, your business model works. And then it runs into your CDN. Now, I'm going to talk about CDNs in a bit more detail in a, in a minute, but Trust me, they're, they're quite complicated, and this is probably about the information you need right now. But it then gets pushed out to your browser, tablet, streaming devices, phones, whatever you want to watch, your sport or your Netflix or whatever it is, it gets pushed out to there. So this is a lot more dynamic. You can put a lot more in here. You can do this flow on five, six, ten, 10, 100 different things all at once. It makes it a lot better because you don't have one single bit of frequency that you are eating up 
Now you have the cloud. You're not eating up any frequency. You have as much real estate as you can afford on a server. That's perfect. In order to do this, we have a thing called adaptive bitrate streaming. Now, this is, as it says here, streaming protocol across HTTP. It detects your bandwidth in real time and it adjusts accordingly. I'm sure some of you would have seen if you're watching something on the internet, and suddenly the quality dips down quite a lot. That's because you don't have enough bandwidth to deal with what it's being served to you. Adaptive bitrate streaming has detected that, that you have a low bandwidth, and it's going to serve you the correct content that you can handle. Well, how it manages this is it chops it into small segments. And we have this diagram here where there's between, typically between 2 and 10 seconds. Um, they're chopped up into these, these two sections here. We've just got 1 megabit and a 512 kilobit here. So we have them listed in what's called a manifest file. And these are all stored, stored on a web service, it's the exact same content stored at two different qualities. 101 megabit, we have all the content for your program here, and 1512 kilobit here, both exactly the same, except when we get to our client, your telephone, your television, whatever, you have your manifest file, it tells you where to find these segments. We detect your bandwidth, and he says he's got all the internet in the world, this is absolutely fine, so it serves you the one megabit content. Let's say this is 10 seconds, because otherwise this guy's going to have a bad time. He gets 10 seconds of fantastic content. Someone then logs onto Netflix in his house. Now he doesn't have any bandwidth left. So we serve him the 512 kilobit. He watches another 10 seconds, it checks again. Same thing, still is not quite there. We serve him another 512 kilobits. Now it's back, we serve him the one megabit, and so on and so on. It adapts as your bandwidth does. Now this is fantastic because whoever this is watching has had picture the entire time. And that's very important when it comes to playback, because if you stop playback, suddenly you're losing customers. People are not interested because your product doesn't work. So now we have playback all the time. It might not be the great quality, but do you really mind that for 10 seconds? Probably not. In order to do this, we have what's called the manifest files, as we discussed. Um, there's three main ones for this. is HLS, which is made by our friends at Apple. Dash, which is made by the Dash Industry Forum. And Microsoft Smooth Streaming, no prizes for guessing who makes that. It's all fairly straightforward. They uh, if we jump straight down here. They're all fairly simple XML manifests. They're nothing too complicated, except Apple, because Apple. Um, basically, what the manifest does is it describes what's, what they can get, describes what they can see, what information there is, what video codecs they've got, what audio codecs that you can access, the encoding ladder, so our 1 megabit, our 512 kilobit. That could be anything. It could be a huge variety of encoding parameters there. And it just says, these are the ones I've got. This is the, the location that you can find these across the internet. And this is how you can do it. It also indicates the DRM technology. Now, that's very, very important. And I'll cover that uh, in the next slide. What it is, three different flavors, mainly. There are quite a lot more. Uh, Play Ready, HLS, Fair Play, and Widevine. They're the ones you'll find in most internet streaming. There are others. And I'm sure some of you who may have worked in media may have come across others and will probably chastise me for not including them, but these are the main ones. They're made by friends at Apple, Google, and Microsoft again, um, respectively in that order. They're content protection, so it prevents you redistributing your content that you've got uh, through screen capture or rebroadcasting. If you've ever tried to take a screenshot from Safari, you may have noticed that if you've got video or you've got picture, it goes black, and you can't share that. That's because of DRM. It says that this is the only person that's allowed to see this content. Don't steal my content. That's what DRM does. It also controls what's called the secure clock. Now, this is very important because uh, some people previously may have tried to change the time on their clock on their computer to try and get around the 24-hour distribution policies that things like Apple and various others have. DRM sets its own clock. Doesn't care what you've got on your computer. From the minute you get it, it's got 24 hours from its own secure clock. Very important that it stops people after that 24 hour window not messing around with their own clocks. This is how it works. Um, the unencrypted content comes through transcoding, exactly as you'd expect in normal movement, comes to packaging, DRM, comes to origin server down to your device. When you ask for a bit of content, it contacts the appropriate DRM server. So if you are playing PlayReady, it contacts the PlayReady server, etc. And it will respond with whether or not you are acceptable or not acceptable to view that content. If you are, great. Now you're watching the live sports. If not, sorry, there's been a problem. The other very important thing is content delivery network. And I'll be honest, I stole this word for word from Wikipedia. So 
they said it better than I did, so you can't argue with that. Um, it's a distributed network of web servers. Um, they provide fast delivery of the content that's available. This diagram is very, very good at visualizing that, that instead of you putting your content to every single person through the internet, which is time consuming and bandwidth consuming, you upload it to one CDN. And that sits there and it distributes the content. Now this is very important. You can visualize this a little easier in this diagram because we've got our origin server here somewhere in Pennsylvania or somewhere in the States. Um, all our content gets served to these blue dots, which are edge servers. Now all these edge servers all have our own content on them. And they're much easier for people to access because if somebody here in Australia tries to access their content from me in the States, it's quite a long way for it to go. So now they're trying to access stuff from here in India or maybe in China or uh, Indonesia. It's closer to them geographically. This is important for the edge because if you're the first person to get on one of these edge servers, it might take a little while to serve you your content, but very crucially, the more people who access your edge, the quicker it will become. It will store this content in the cache edge and it will make sure that it's available to you very, very quickly without having you buffering and waiting and, and having a horrible time because you're trying to get it from the States. This is very important, um, and I'm gonna show you a, a map in a moment. A, because it's one of my favorite pitches in the world, and B, because it demonstrates a point why CDNs are important. This is a map of the undersea pipelines for the internet. This is how the internet gets around the world. So when somebody tells you it is wireless, it's not. It's on pipes under the sea. Um, there are lots of other ways, but <laughs> this one's more fun. Um, if you are trying to get content from here in New York over to Australia, it takes a long time. There's a lot of routes there, a lot of switching, a lot of pipes. Regardless of how fast your internet, it still has to go through all these switches to get there. It takes a long time. Geographically, it is closer for you to pick something up from India to Australia. It's as simple as that. It's a short distance. It's easy to get content quicker. So with all that in mind, now we're looking at, this is a couple of years ago now, and this is a Hulu. I'm sure many of you know who Hulu is. It's a streaming company. They, they don't really care. And so from a QA point of view, this is exactly the kind of thing I want to see. They don't care about their encoding. They leave this upstream. They totally don't care. They just get all the money in. They package it up with their HLS manifest and they push it to every one of their CDNs in the States. And every four or 10 seconds, it gets pushed to devices. At the same time, they attach all their metadata, their EPG, emails, VOD catalog data, etc. They push this all together with their manifests and they get pushed every four to 10 seconds. Whilst also, if you're on their non-premium, you get your ad server, you get the intelligence unit that plugs onto that, it serves you your ads. And at the same time, we're talking to our digital rights management, which makes sure you can see it. This is a very simplified version of it, but this is a very good way of visualizing how OTT works in most companies. They don't care about this side of it. They just care about packaging up the content they get and they're shoving it out to customers. Now, the reason I mentioned that this is live is because live versus VOD is two different things. Video on demand is completely already stored. It's in the cloud. It's waiting for people to come in. It's been pre-edited. Yes, you may have to warm up your CDN by hitting the edge the first time, but after that, it's just going to keep coming. It's got a single manifest. You don't have to waste computing power making sure that you're getting the right thing again. There's low customer pressure, which means you end up watching the golf with your feet up. Everybody would rather be doing that than getting panicky, I'm sure. Live, on the other hand, you can have multiple manifests. It can change per segment. You have to pick the best CDN. What if something changed? What if the data center in China goes down and now all of a sudden you have to go and ask for one in Russia? And this is a different thing. It's operating slightly differently. Now you have to change. Latency, huge problem in playback testing. Latency, it's everywhere. I do talk about it a little bit, but it's, it's a real problem. And that means high customer pressure. And that's really important here at Zone because sports fans are very angry. Sometimes they can be very angry, as this gentleman is here. <laughs> now, I mentioned latency, and latency is one of the most important things to test for a few QA guys if you're doing playback. It can come from lots of places, video encoding, content ingestion, your segment length. This is very important because if your segment length is three seconds, you have a three second delay versus absolute time. That is a fact, and people forget that. So the fact that you have this delay, you have to factor that in. 
So your network propagation and your transport protocols, your CDN, all of these things come together. They're all on the left-hand side here of what you were talking about in our Hulu example. But mainly it's the player. And this is where it's important. Is what are your policies like for your player? How aggressively do you buffer? Where does your playhead sit in your live interaction? And how resilient is your player? You know, is it gonna fall over at the drop of a hat? These are some of the seconds that we, we talk about with reduced latency, the highest end of that is 18 seconds. I think we can all agree that's quite a lot. If you're aware of that, 18 seconds when you're watching the World Cup and somebody scores and your neighbor celebrates and you have 18 seconds before you see that happen, that's a bit annoying, right? The kind of best scenario that we aim for here, about five seconds for OTT. It's in the low latency, it's sort of acceptable. Within broadcast, there's something called the broadcast delay. It's built into every single broadcast that's made. It's about eight seconds, and that's for many other things, but primarily things like naughty words, wardrobe malfunctions, things like that. We don't want to see them on TV. They pulled eight seconds in. They stopped that. That's totally acceptable, which is why five seconds is totally acceptable at OTT. Ultra low latency, people are aiming for this. It's a very ambitious 0.2 seconds latency. We'll see how anybody gets there. The other thing that I, I think is very important is AV sync. Now I'll do you an analogy for this. If I'm holding a basketball and I drop it and it hits the floor and then you hear it, you're kind of okay with that. You, you realize that sound travels at a slower speed than light does. But if I drop that same basketball and you hear it when it's at my knee, that's a bit weird and your brain doesn't really like that. It doesn't like the idea that sound can travel faster than light. That messes with you a bit. Which is why we tend to say audio to video is a lot stricter in testing. Dolby, for instance, makes sure that they have a plus minus five milliseconds audio to video, whereas they have a plus minus 15 seconds for video to audio. So it's very noticeable, it's about a three to one. The other thing is load. How many people are you expecting to reach? How many screens are you gonna be on? How many screens in the house? What are your peak viewers? What are your low numbers? Things like that. Are you you're gonna have a problem when you don't have enough people using your system? It's possible. You've got to simulate real world and, and the usage thereof. And you've got to consider your load versus stress. If you load up your events, you can end up crashed on the side of the road next to a cow. That's not good. We don't want that. We want a good evenly spread load that we can carry that all day. This guy's probably laughing and whistling his whole way all the way back to the barn. He's fine. You've got to test your CDN edges for these things. If you, do, if you put stress on them, they'll break. If you load them correctly, they should be fine as long as you've got decent load balances. The other thing is localization and territories. Where are you targeting? And very importantly, and it's amazing how many people forget this, how do the conditions change in that country? You know, you may have a really good internet connection in your house at home, but that doesn't mean that in Brazil, they have the same internet connection. It's a very difficult thing to, to emulate within the lab. So the best way of doing it is to be in country. You can see that. You're serving different content to different targets. Are you restricted legally by any of the content? How are you gonna make sure that you test that? You can't have your content slip into somebody else's region. They could have some serious ramifications there, fines or otherwise. Additional requirements, closed captions, big thing. The US in particular, they make sure that you have to have closed captions. It has to happen. Every single thing you put out on an OTG platform has to have closed captions, which means if you wanna be in the States, you have to have them, it's as simple as that. Accessibility, that's a big topic in and of itself, but how accessible is your app? How accessible is your player? Can people operate it without the use of a mouse? What if they're partially sighted? What if they're deaf? You know, how do they operate things? Accessibility is a huge thing, worthy of a whole talk in and of itself, but it's big in itself. Loudness, another massive thing. Again, the state's leading the way with legislation on this. that You have to have your program on a certain loudness level. It has to match the adverts that came in because advert, very sneaky, used to be slightly louder than your programming. You used to make you wake up, pay attention to the ad. Suddenly now you're buying all those tactical glasses they're advertising you in the infomercials. Ad insertion, how do you test that? It's very complicated, it's very complicated and you have to make sure that everything meshes together at the same time. Error rates, what are you interested in? What happens if your CDN rotates? What happens if China's data center goes down? What happens if it happens right at the beginning of somebody watching something or midway through? How do you handle that? Your API responses, it's amazing how many people forget that we, we'd love as QA to blame the customer every time. It's always the customer or the developer, but sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's our side. You know, we do need to look at that. 
Third party errors, your encoding, your data centers, your content providers, even down to your ISP provider here. I've also put in geographical and meteorological as we discussed, but it's very difficult to simulate a storm happening on your building. So, you know, if you can, we'll speak after. You end up with errors. The other big one is quality of experience. Now, quality of experience is very important because it's customer facing. It's the, the measurement for how the product or service is actually being received by them. It's very important you don't confuse this with quality of service. Quality of service is your bandwidth, your latency, everything that we've just discussed that you have some degree of control over. Quality of experience, you have pretty much nothing control over that. It's very, very important. I'm going to demonstrate this point now that everybody sort of sees things differently on quality of experience. Just by a show of hands, would you watch this video? Cool, no, I think that's a round no. Would you watch this video? Yeah, a couple of people putting their hands up, yeah. Okay, what about that? Well, one or two at the back, <laughs> yeah. How about that one? Yeah, yeah. That one? That's a few more. How about that one? Yeah? How about that one? How many of you don't want to watch it because it's the MotoGP? Yeah. For them, would you watch this football game? Again, let's forget it's Swansea for a minute. How about that one? <laughs> yeah, a few more, a few more. How about that one? Yeah? How about that one? No? So, the, the point I'm making is that the qualities that you've just seen do not vary very much. For those of you who put your hands up for watching stuff on the early slides for the GP, some of those were lower quality than the high quality of this football. This low quality, this is the same quality as the third highest quality on the GP. It's completely up to you. I've watched football in qualities like this. I'm sure many of you have. I've watched other sports in qualities like this. Do I enjoy it? Not particularly. Would I rather watch it in HD? Of course, that's my quality of experience. That doesn't necessarily mean it's yours. Your customers are the people who tell you about the quality of their experience, and they're very important, because otherwise, how are you gonna know? It's very tricky. Playback in a microservice as well, for those who don't know very much about microservices. Microservices means that we used to have this monolithic architecture where we'd have everything built in one big repo. Everything would come out all at once. We'd have sweeping great big changes and we'd have everything would be a real problem if you had the slightest bug. You'd have to roll back everything and uh, God knows teams hated that because you'd roll back all their shiny new changes. Microservice world, everything feeds into the user interface in tiny little teams, little, inter little interfaces. So you can break it down, and the idea is that you can release things very easily, very manageably between the microservices without having them dependence on other teams. It's very, very good in that manner because you don't end up with one big release comes out and all of a sudden you roll everything back. Now, I can release five, six, a hundred, a thousand times a day if I want to, as long as I've got a good rollback policy, very, very important, make sure you've got a rollback policy. I can do that all I want in my team because it doesn't affect anybody else. It's not a problem. Can playback fit into the microservice model? Absolutely it can. Absolutely it can. It can fit into the microservice model possibly better than any other team. Can it be full stack? Possibly. It fits in a lot of places. You've got playback at the front end, you can have a team doing the UI. So the back end, you can have teams dealing with your APIs and your upstream ingest. You've also got all your upstream CDN encoding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you come in third parties. This is this is quite full stack, I think we'd agree. It's not quite full stack necessarily, but is it half stack? Possibly a better term, I'll let you make your mind up on that. The other one, contentiously, is it a tech or a product responsibility? It splits rooms, it splits teams, it splits people's minds. It's, I'll let you make your own decision on that, I hope you have my opinion. But. So what do you test? How long have you got? And what do you care about? This is the questions that we'll ask on any team. It's not specific to playback. It is every single team that I'm sure every single QA here would have actually thought about. It's, uh, what do I do? Do you care about the UI? Do you care about presentation and video? Do you care about the UI metadata? Do you care about APIs or their metadata? Do you care about the DRM server? Do you care about CDNs and encoding? You should care about the integration with the app. <laughs> That's very important. But maybe you don't. Maybe you have an isolated team and someone else deals with the integration. 
personally, I don't trust anybody if they say they tested the integration. It's my player, I'll test that. Thank you very much. Devices. We've talked about this whole thing. This has all been geared at web. What if you're testing devices? This is a whole new section of stuff in and of itself. It's very, very complicated. But always remember the testing triangle. It's very easy, very cheap to run your unit tests. You get people running unit tests. They catch a lot of things. They're very useful. As you come up to your UI test, they're very expensive to change and they're very slow. You can get very big problems with your UI. Now this goes away in some of the microservice models. You can make it work a lot more. They become less expensive. They don't become cheap. They become less expensive. And one of my favorite things, one that splits people, is testing in production. This is an actual photo of the very first bulletproof vest being tested. And that man is too happy. <laughs> But I like to think of myself in this situation. I like diving in. I like being happy about testing in production. And then one of the ways that we can do that now, and this is the big scary future, is we can utilize the cloud and Chaos QA. The cloud is the future. The problem is system faults are inevitable. You can't control the whole system. They're going to be there. Playback is highly vulnerable to that, really, really vulnerable to that. So you should embrace the chaos. Now, some of you may be familiar with chaos engineering as an idea and some of the things that do with it. Some of you may not, but Netflix have come up with their lovely Simeon Army tools. Um, and they cover a lot of things. Uh, chaos Monkey was their first one. And chaos Monkey would go into a live production system and it would randomly and on an automated fashion kill one of their services in production. Now that's pretty scary. You can almost hear the intake of breath from product on that. But it's very important. If you plan to take down a service. You make that well known, you tell people, you tell people in the development team, they prep for it. They make sure everything is ready. And often it works and it's great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's ready in production. If you do this with Chaos Monkey, it's completely at random. It'll take down something that you don't even know. Now you can't prep for that because you don't know what it is. And the reason I mentioned that is because I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute from 2016 of the Amazon and Netflix microservice infrastructure. And you'll see why it's so complicated and why manual testing of shutting down services is just unfeasible. Because they're crazy. These are all the connections in 2016, right? So we've already come several years from that. They're probably bigger blobs that you can't understand in that. These are very complicated and you can't possibly, Chaos Monkey will cut one of these wires, see what happens, kill a data center, do whatever you want. You're not going to be able to test that, and you're sure not going to do it in production because you won't get that past anybody. Guarantee it. Chaos Monkey will. Resilience is the key. Build resilience into your players. It's very, very important. You will have infrastructure failures. You will have network failures. You will have application failures. And unfortunately, you will have third party failures. That's just going to happen. Kill them. See what happens. That's the best way to find out what will happen in real life. Just get rid of them, see what happens. Chaos engineering, it makes it random, it makes it automated, it gives you good feedback. It's vitally important that you do this for any playback because you don't control the structure. Just to cover some final thoughts that I have on this, uh, testing glass to glass is not plausible. It's possible, it's not plausible. Focus on what's important to you. That's the biggest takeaway you can here. This is not just playback, this is any QA that you can have. Don't try and test everything. You will fail, and you will fail hard, and you will hate yourself for it. <laughs> test as close to the real world as possible. Test in production. Please, please, please go and argue to test in production, even if that means you yourself at home. <coughs> Show of hands, who's got Netflix? Yeah, that's most of you. You're all testing in prod, all of you. Netflix takes all that data. They pull it in. They know exactly what they're doing with that. Go and do that. Do that for your own companies. Do it for your own players. Embrace the chaos and trust your, see your upstream suppliers. I know we don't as QAs. We don't trust anybody and if it doesn't come from my hand. But you're going to have to because you can't test all of this. This is something you can't control. And possibly the most important thing and something you hear in any QA ever, automate, 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 but please don't assume that it'll solve all your problems. You're never going to get 100% coverage and nothing at all will ever beat a bum on a seat with eyes on glass. They will spot things. They will spot things so much quicker than a machine will because a machine will tell you everything is correct, but there isn't anything on the screen. That's not good. That's me. Thank you very much for listening.